Welcome to the Life's Best Medicine Podcast, where we are finding hope and healing one episode at a time. No appointment needed, no rubber gloves, and no coping. Just a healthy dose of life lessons to help equip you for this wild journey we call life. Hello and welcome back to the Life's Best Medicine podcast. This is a dangerous one. This this guy was the first guy that we ever had as a guest actually on the Low Carb MD podcast, believe it or not, as a real guest besides Mitro and Jason Fung. Uh, gosh, this guy's a legend. He goes way back. He has a podcast that's, that's just everyone listens to it. So many patients of mine are like, hey, do you know Vinny? Do you like Vinny? I'm like, well, let's speak off the record here. But man, Vinny Torchich, man, I really wanted you to have you on this podcast so people know who you are, because I know you're a showman, you're out there, you're doing all kinds of crazy stuff, you're making movies, writing books, and I'll, I'll run through those real quick, because I know we're limited on time, but Fitness Confidential, which is your podcast and your book, NSNG, everyone who hears that, man, I hear that almost every day, how much of an impact that made, um, pure vitamin club you do you do coffee you do you do it all man and and uh you know your uh your movie's fat fat too and then uh beyond impossible talking about the impossible burger and all that stuff but man the thing that i love about you you stand up like you'll be the lone voice everyone else will say 99 percent of people say one thing and and you'll stand up against them so i want people to hear more about your backstory so welcome it's an honor to have you brian it's always a pleasure from, from the first time i met you well, I probably had too much to drink that night, um, but um, we met at we met when I was out there um, in San Diego working on the original Fata documentary, and um, it, it was it was interesting because, it, as it turns out, <clears throat> I didn't know this until later. I wasn't even I wasn't even um, welcome there. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, maybe I'm talking out of turn a little bit. There was an event when I did Fat of Documentary One, or at the time it was the only one I did, so it wasn't one yet. It was just Fat of Documentary. Uh, we had to figure out because I only had a quarter of a million dollars to do it with. You know, we crowdfunded the thing, <clears throat> and you know, when you have a full movie crew you got to get as many interviews in as you possibly can of the people you want to interview. And we looked around and went, wait a minute. It would be cheaper than flying Gary Taubes in here and flying this person and flying that person and putting them up for a day or two and winding them and dining them. There's a convention going, going on down in, in San Diego what was it called, Brian? It was Low Carb. Let's give them a low, plug. Low, yeah, Low Carb USA, San Diego. Yeah, Low Carb USA, San Diego. And a lot of the people, we not probably 40 or 50% of people we wanted to interview for the movie were going to be there giving speeches. And I look, I know how these things work <clears throat> because I'm invited to do speeches all the time. They don't really pay these people to go do this stuff. Right. No one's getting paid. So they're doing it. Some of them, like if Gary Taubes goes, it's out of the goodness of his heart. Uh, some doctors go to these things because you guys get credit, right? Right, Brian? Well, you know, a lot of us go just for the community. You know, we like the people and we go, okay, look, it's a, it's a little kind vacation. Of medical, it's some kind of medical credit you guys get or something at some of these events? or Yeah, yeah. Continuing medical education, CME, right. we call it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, you know, for, for the uh, Gary Taubes of the world and the, you know, um, people like um, um, Nina Teicholds and Nina Teichold, yeah, 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 they're, yeah, they're not getting paid to be there. Right. They're, they're just showing up just because. Right. And they're not getting paid. You know, they might get their trip, you know, comped or something. But that's about it. Even, you know, um, Feldman told me, he goes, oh, man, he goes. I'm out of pocket on this, you know, Dave Feldman. And he was one of the guys interviewing and he was kind of lamenting and complaining. He was like, I'm out of pocket, you know? And we went in there and we rented in the same hotel room. We, we, we rented two or three rooms side by side by side. And we took one room and just unbolted the whole thing and turned it into a soundstage, right? 
And um, I didn't know Brian at that time. Otherwise, you would have seen the room. I can show you pictures of it and show you what we did. And you're going to, I can't believe you guys did it. Man, I'm, I'm not falling for going up to your room, Vinny. I've heard stories, man. <laughs> Some of them may be true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we went there and we did this thing and we interviewed a lot of these people all in one day. And then we, you know, we, we slept that night. We, we packed up everything. We returned the room to looking like a room and uh, we left the next day. And turns out, I found out later, we weren't even welcome to, <laughs> to be like, they, they got upset that we were there. And I've never really gotten to the bottom as to why they were upset. Yeah, you know, these things happen. You kind of, you know, it's one of those things you crash the party and you have a better party sometimes and have fun. And, you know, I think it's just, uh, you know, life in general. This, you this kinda, is Brian you know, being diplomatic because uh, yeah. he's friends with the, <laughs> the guy. Yeah, I'm right. friends with everyone. I'm like, hey, let me go be the go-between because, you know, <laughs> you want everyone to get along. I mean, we're a, it's a great community and so many people work together. And, you know, I, I think you kind of see the big vision. You go, okay, I'll take a loss on this because you get your name out there. And, you know, it just, you know, even obviously podcasts, we don't charge to go on people's podcasts, of course, but, right. All right. you know, but you get the name out there. So a lot of my patients now, though, I go, hey, how did you hear about me? Oh, I heard you on Vinny. I like that you were on Vinny's, yeah. right? So it happens. I mean, there, there's benefits in people speaking, getting out there and getting your name out there. There are benefits outside of just the money part. But I think a lot of people, they believe in a cause like you, you know, putting yourself out there, risking making the movies. And I know those guys who put on the conference, I know they lose money most of the time, believe yeah. it or not, because of the, just the paying for flights and, and dinners and hotels and all that kind of stuff or whatever it is. But, but I think it's just, uh, you know, I think sometimes you just have to monopolize. I mean, you're a guy who monopolizes. You figure out like how to make it. You go, I want to do this movie. How do I make it work? And you figure out the logistics and you make it happen. And that's, that's what I want people to hear about you too, is the, the backstory of, you know, what made you the, the fly in the ointment, the guy who stood up and goes, wait a minute, you guys are all saying this thing and I see it different than you guys do. You know, I think that's a gift that we've lost in, in the country. I, I I think, um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, I like to joke, joke around a lot, I'm, but I'm kind of a no bullshit guy in life. And I don't know what it was, you know, I, I came from, you know, kind of a strict Italian family where, you know, there's, there's a universal truth behind everything, right? There's no, my, I came from a real, you know, these people were peasants from Italy, my, my great grandparents and, and the whole thing. And, they had to work really hard. And, and, you know, there was a, just a truth that you lived by, right? And, I, you know, I grew up, I guess you could call me some kind of savant, idiot savant. I don't have the ability to lie. You know, <laughs> it's like, it, it, there's a truth out there. And I just tell the truth. And sometimes it hurts and people don't want to hear the truth. And I've gotten better at life where I'll go, well, you know what, I'm just going to, I don't want to hurt this person's feelings. So I just won't say anything. So I have picked up some social cues and mores along the way to figure out that. But whenever I'm talking about health and fitness, I don't care. I don't care whose feelings I'm hurting. Because I look around and I see morbidly obese people. You know, I graduated high school in 81. I had a degree in 85 or 84, by 85, I was working in Newman School in New Orleans. And I noticed kids were decidedly girthier than when I was in high school. And that was only five years later. And I looked around and went, well, Newman School is a rich, whitey kid school, right? I mean, these are just rich, white. But the sports there and everything were excellent. You know, that's where, that's where Archie Manning's kids all went to school. That's where Arch, the number one quarterback in the nation, he's at that school now. Right. Um, so there's that, but I'm looking, these kids are eating stuff I never saw before. Like when I grew up in Donaldsonville, Louisiana, I, I never saw juice in a box that you push a straw through. Right. And it's just high fructose corn syrup in a box and, and kids were eating candy. And for me, candy was kind of a treat. Uh, they were always drinking sodas. I noticed that they would come to the gym, they, they would stop at the soda machine and get a soda. And again, you know, I'm like, is it me or are these kids always eating sugar and drinking stuff? And I just noticed that they, they were puffier, they were bigger. And we're talking <clears throat> 1985, they weren't, we weren't there yet, but boy, we were well on our way. 
And I started seeing all this stuff like uh, snack wells. All my clients were eating snack wells. And I was going, what's a snack well? Because I was never, you know, I came from where we ate real food. You know, I came from this family in the swamp and everything was like, eat your meat, eat your potato, right? Eat your, you know, we were eating real food. And all of a sudden, I'm, you know, someone said to me, yeah, snack wells, there's no fat in it. So you can't get fat. It's just sugar. It's like, well, my grandmother called sugar a hollow calorie, meaning there's no nutrition to it at all. It's just junk, right? And yeah, yeah, but you're not going to get fat from sugar. You only get fat from fat. And, and the year before that, I was in Aspen, Colorado, again, with rich people. Rich people took me around to go do stuff, right, to go train them. And I'm in Aspen, and everyone's reading this book called Eat to Win by Robert Haas, Dr. Robert Haas. I don't know if you remember that book, Brian, but I'm too young, man. Go, go get that book and read it. You're going to think it's a joke. You're going to go, okay, this was written by Mad Magazine or something like that. You're going to think it's just the onion wrote this book. He's literally saying that fat burns in the flame of carbohydrates. The more carbs you eat, the more weight oh, yeah. you're going to lose. And that's when we started in restaurants. I remember everybody in Aspen that summer would go to um, a place called Metzaluna's. And if you remember, there was one in Brentwood. That's where OJ's wife had her yeah. final meal and, and, and Ron Goldman worked there. But yeah. this was the Metzalunas in Aspen. And again, I'm a poor kid and I'm with rich people and I'm looking at the menu and I'm going, a plate of pasta is 16 bucks? That's like, it's like a side dish. And they would bring out a big mound of pasta and it might be like three shrimp on top or something like that. And that was the dish. And I'm like, and everybody's going, oh, you can eat all the pasta you want. You won't, don't eat too many shrimp. There's cholesterol in that shrimp. And I'm listening to all this stuff going, did the world just go nuts? Yeah, you just went back to your old common sense of what you did before. And you're seeing the, the effects of that. And that's what's crazy about it. When you start looking at it going, holy cow. Like, you know, as a matter of fact, my friend owns an Italian restaurant. He goes, Brian, if you want me to cry, come in and don't drink and just order the biggest steak we have. And he said, I lose money on that. Because we make the money on the pasta and the pizza and all the other stuff that doesn't cost us anything, right? So they want to push those things for sure. No, it, it, it's so true. And I'm, I'm looking at my great grandmother from the old country, who English was her second language. She knew that if you ate bread and pasta, you gained weight, you got fat. My great grand, how does my great grandmother, who was born in the 18, well, was she born in the 1800s? Maybe. Yeah, because she died when she was almost 100 and she died. No, she, yeah, she was born in the late 18. How did she know this from Italy, yet no one else knew this? Yeah, it's, right? that, it, it's that simple logic. You, you make observation. And that's what's, what's crazy is we, we've gotten away from that observation. Everyone just jumps and says, this is what you do. And everyone says, okay, that's what you do. And no one says, hey, wait a minute. Maybe that's not what we, do. That's what, not what we should be doing. Yeah. And then along comes, you know, at some point, I wasn't certainly the first person to start talking about this. Um, I knew Stephen Finney and Jeff Volek were out there for a long time and always looked for articles. And this was before the internet was really a thing, but they were doing stuff. And and um, Gary Taubes wrote Good Calorie, Bad Calorie. And I was like, yes, finally, someone's bringing Atkins back, right? Because this is what I was talking to with my clients all these years. You got to stay away from carbs and the whole thing. And they would joke with me. I was like, well, I guess I'll be a good looking corpse because I'm going to die of this cholesterol poisoning that everyone's talking about. Yeah. And I had to weather all of those storms through, through the late 80s and 90s. And the only reason, Brian, that anyone listened to me in LA was because when you're an actor or an actress and you have to look a certain way for a movie, they will do whatever it takes. And if their agent or their manager or the studio says you need to work with this idiot and he's going to get you there, then they're going to listen to everything I say, right? Of course, they would fire me right after they did the movie. And then some of them, if there were women, a lot of times what women would do um, is they would go, okay, I shot the movie. Um, my husband and I are going to have a kid now. You know, they, they'll plan a pregnancy and they would pop the kid out before you know, the movie would come out because it takes about a year to sort of get them out or even longer. They would hold them longer than that. And some of them would go, okay, uh, here we are. 
um, now I need to lose this baby weight to go on the red carpet and, and go do all the, the, you know, and then they would hire me back for a few weeks and they would, you know, get me, you know, to, they would lose the weight and then say, Oh, all this bacon and, and, and beef and everything this can't be good for you. So I'm going to go away from you again, you know, and it was this weird thing, but that's how I made a living. Right. And it wasn't until Gary started talking about it, that one of my famous Hollywood clients, a TV writer and producer, and, um, you know, pretty well known for, you know, my wife and kids TV show, and also um, uh, Arrested Development and all that, Dean Laurie. He said, you know, you almost died of cancer with these secrets. Why don't you put them out there? And I was like, all right, uh, I'll just write a book. And th that, that's what we did. And that's how, you know, when you say you became the fly in the ointment, this is a long way around of me saying, yeah, I guess I did, but I, I didn't mean to be. I just decided, hey, this is what we're doing, and I'll just tell the truth. Why not? Yeah, and I don't think you go out of your way to irritate people. I think you go out of your way and say, hey, look, here's what the data shows. Here's what it says, and, and correcting what you see as incorrect. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a good way of putting it. And sometimes people go, why do you hate vegans? It's like, I don't hate vegans. I have vegan friends. I like them. And I like a lot, you know, I have vegans that call me for consults and everything else. I just don't like when vegan doctors who are being disingenuous and know that they're being disingenuous, just make up stuff out of whole cloth. You know, um, I'm talking to you, Michael Greger. I'm talking to you, um, Walter Willett, uh, Clapper, um, Khan. I can just go down the list. I mean, they make up stuff out of whole cloth. And they lie to people. And I'm sitting here going, wait, in South Africa, they took uh, Dr. Noakes and ran him through two trials costing the taxpayers down there or over there and down there uh, millions of dollars in each trial. Yet we have these guys in the United States just making up stuff whole cloth and we don't do anything about it. Yeah, the double standard is amazing. It really is. Yeah, guilty until proven innocent, right? And and sure. they have the data because they're scientists, and they said, "Here's what I believe, and here's what I stand for." And they could have backed down and and you know put an end to a lot of this stuff, but I think you know it's one of those those it's a dangerous thing when you stand up for what you believe to be true, and that's what you were doing before any of these guys were doing it, also. And so I think you know I've always been interested in your your backstory as far as that. I mean, you know, getting diagnosed with cancer at a young age and going, okay, like was there ever a time when you going through that where you go? I may not make it through this, or did you always say, okay, I'm going to fight this and get through it? Uh, I had somewhat of a pragmatic approach. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I did was um, I went through cancer almost alone. Um, <clears throat> I, I wasn't in a relationship. I hadn't met Serena yet. Um, as a matter of fact, that's a lie. Um, I met Serena through a friend and saw her. And I went, man, she's kind of hot. And my friend told me a couple of days later, remember the girl you... you She's got a boyfriend and I just forgotten about Serena. And then I went off and had cancer and then eight months later met her again. But I went through cancer alone. And um, I, I called my parents uh, early on and I, I lied to them. I said, um, uh, look, I, I have cancer. And they told me that um, the doctors told me this is a, a rare cancer. It's a leukemia, but don't, don't be scared with that word. Uh, they told me I have like the, the common cold version of it. And they said, they're going to give me a, a quick round of this medication. I didn't even use the word chemo. And they told me I'm going to be hunky dory. And um, my mom was like, w would you like us to come? And I was like, no, 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 please. No, no, I need to rest. You know, they told me I just need to rest. So I couldn't even be truthful with my parents because I didn't want them to worry. If that makes sense at all. And yeah. um, I was released um, to the custody of my friend who was an, an oncologist who was not my doctor. So I was able, you know, I was on chemo. They had the pump on me with the pick line and they just kept shoving the medicine. I mean, I was released to her house and I couldn't, if anyone came over to visit or say, hi, I couldn't, I had to put a mask on. I couldn't hug them, this kind of thing, because I was very susceptible. And it, it was kind of a weird, lonely time for me. Um, if, if I remember right, I, I don't know why I got into the can. I guess you asked about the cancer thing, but yeah, but how, how did that change you going through that? Did it make you a different person on the way out? Did it make you, you know, 
throw caution to the wind more? Did it make you more conservative? What, what did it do to you as a, as a person, like going through that? Um, it, it, did, it did do a few things. You know, people go, how, how are you different after cancer and before? And I was like, well, I was more of an asshole afterwards because I decided I didn't give a fuck anymore. Can I curse on you? I'm sorry. <laughs> you just did, man. I guess it's, it's there. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. Um, <laughs> hey, we want the real Vinny. That's all right. That's yeah, all right. You, you just got him. Um, but, I, you know, I, I didn't care, you know, anymore. It was like, and that's when Dean Laurie finally got me to open up. And he goes, why? Everyone wanted me to write the book of my Hollywood clients, right? And, you know, <clears throat> I was offered deals by Simon & Schuster and HarperCollins and all this stuff. And I was like, I'm not going to mention names. I'm not going to do this. So just go away. And they, oh, you, you, you'll make millions and you'll be famous because you're the one who out. It's like, why am I outing people who paid my bills for 30 years? Why would I do that to anyone? And they, they even said to me, were, were there anyone? Out there? Did you hate some of them? I, absolutely, I did. Let's talk about those. No, they still paid my bills. You don't have to like everyone you work for. Yeah, that's what happens when people go for the money and they sell out people that have either helped them or, or took care of them along the way. And you see that. That's the sad part of Hollywood. And that's one thing. It's funny. You know, I think I told you that before. But when everyone goes, oh, my gosh, you know who's here? Vinny Tortridge is Vinny's here. At that same conference you were talking about. Yeah. I was like, okay. Like, I don't, I, I mean, he's one of those Hollywood guys or whatever. I'm not going to stoke his ego or whatever. But then when we ran into you, I'm like, I wouldn't have met you ever. And I was like, yeah, oh, he's a cool guy. We just sat in BS for a little while, right? In the, in the yeah. whole way. And, you know, but when, you know, I, I, but I see, P, I've seen a lot of people, friends that have gone to Hollywood to do stuff. And then I see them get spit out and chewed up and come back a different person, just totally compromise their integrity and their values and all that stuff. And it seems that you were able to kind of see things for what they were and maybe like maintain your humanity in a crazy situation. I think it's because I came from a good family. You know, that, that, that's what it comes down to. You know, I just never... I never put, you know, we all have our own set of morals and, you know, we, we, you just hang on to that. And, um, you know, I, I just, I, I wasn't about to sell anyone out. Um, but after cancer, I did take more of a, it, it was, you know, when you're sitting there and, and you're just with your own thoughts because everyone's off working, even my friend, she was a doctor. She had her own place to go to every day and the whole thing. And, I, and I'm just alone, right? And the internet's not really a thing yet. You know, like you could go and Google something or whatever, but it wasn't like everyone on Insta chat and all this kind of stuff. So I was just kind of alone reading magazines. And I'll tell you a couple of things I did, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, but one of the things I did was I was like, okay, I'm, I might die, right? There's a good possibility of death here. Um, if this round of chemo doesn't work, and then they said they have this other thing, but that chemo can actually kill me and all this stuff. And I said, so I might die, right? This might be it. And you start thinking, who, who's going to come to your funeral? Who, who's going who's gonna to cry, right? Well, my, my brothers and my family, you know, their wives, you know. And you start thinking, oh, my, my old friends, the guys I play football with, maybe a couple of those guys. My, you're sitting there planning your funeral, right? It's like, who might show up? And then it got more morose for me. Um, I started going, what are they going to say about me? You know, not at the funeral, because at the funeral, they'll tell a few stories. Remember that time we went fishing with Vinny? And yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah they, what are they going to say about me after that? Or what are they going to say when they find out I died, right? Oh, Vinny, remember, what did he end up doing in life? Oh, he went out to Hollywood and rolled around on the carpet with a couple of these actresses. I don't know what he, I had to, he called himself a trainer or something. I, don't know. I realized that I had gone through a whole life, worked my, my ass off, made some money, and I had nothing tangible to show. Like if I died, I had nothing tangible to show for it. And that bothered me more than death. Right here, I am early 40s, doesn't look good, and I'm worried about what people are going to say for five minutes after I die. Because after that, that's it, they don't talk about you again, you're gone. Right? That's it. Yeah, I think we all come to those kind of conclusions. You know, a good friend of mine's a pastor, and he goes, You know, Brian, it's, it's really about the potato salad. And I'm like, What are you talking about? And he was making the point 
you die. Everyone goes back to Aunt Betty's, Betty's house or whatever, and they eat potato salad. And they talk about your life. And he goes, I don't know why they always have potato salad, these things. But they're going to say, hey, what a waste. Or, hey, he helped me that day. Or he did that dumb thing when we went fishing. And all these stories and, and interactions we have. And so many of us, myself included, for 18 years, worked my life away. I'm probably for 25 years worked my life away because you're, you want to be a doctor. You want to go through med school. You have to go through residency. Then you get, you know, so everything gets put on hold, really, you know, as far as life goes. And someone like you, you can get caught up in the party scene. You can be out there just, you know, and, and just really never impact people really it's just a superficial life where you never really impacted people deeply yeah and i i was worried about that you know that that worried me that i was going through a life and i thought just making really good money which is what i was doing was like the end all be all you know because i never spend money but i like that i had a healthy bank account and cancer was like re that money was just going away i had to sell stocks i had to do all kinds of stuff because even though I had good insurance, there's a lot of bills to pay when you're living in LA and you don't, you know, everything stops. Your income yeah, you stops. can't work and you got, yeah, you got chemo. You're, you're, you can't be exposed to people and all that. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're sitting around going, wow, so money really didn't matter. You know, <laughs> I'm glad I have some to go pay for this cancer, but is that why I was saving money? Is this the rainy day? I mean, you, you really, I started going through some weird stuff and, and I said, this can't be it. This cannot be it. I, I, there's gotta be something else. Right. And I didn't know what the something else was, but I said, if I make it out of here, I got to do things differently. I, I really have to do things differently. I, I, I want to fall in love. I, I, you know, I never, I was never in a really good relationship. It's like, I need to find the right woman. I got to stop dating women based on them just being hot because that's Hollywood, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I was never interested in a real relationship. I say, oh my God, a girl's a smoke show. Let me take her out a few times. Who are you impressing? I wasn't impressing me. I wasn't even happy with these people, right? And it just so happens I wasn't even cleared by my doctor yet, but we knew I was doing better because my tests, they kept doing uh, bone marrow biopsies and, and, Things were turning around, and um, I, I met Serena again and realized after talking to her for five or ten minutes, oh, wait, we met about eight months ago, and, you know, we started talking, and, um, you know, I ended up in a great relationship. So that was one thing that changed. And I know that doesn't sound like much to the audience. It's like, why is he talking about this? But it meant something to me. Oh, my God. I'm falling in love with someone. You know, this is a real thing, right? And then Dean Laurie kept saying to me, you need to write a book. You need to, and I kept going, I don't want to write a book. I don't want to write a book. You know, I, I was kicking and screaming about all of this stuff. And he said, I want you to read a book. And he had me read Kitchen Confidential by uh, Anthony Bourdain. And then I realized, oh, wait, I can write a book like that. Right, that's why I named my book Fitness Confidential. It was, it was an homage to um, uh, Kitchen Confidential, Anthony Bourdain's book, and you know, just kicking and screaming the whole way. And then, and then, uh, you know, uh, William Morris Agency said, "We love this book, but nobody knows your name on the internet. You you don't exist. You know, we Googled you. You don't exist." And I went, "Isn't that great? No one knows who I am. This is great." And they went, "No, no, no, no. We can't sell a book unless the internet knows who you are." right? Within a week, I started a podcast. And here we are 2100 plus shows down the road. And somehow I've become the fly in the ointment. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's all about just telling the truth, right? That that's all we have. I think that's why I started this podcast too. Let me tell the truth of the way I see it. And let me give testimonies of people who've been through it you know going through cancer going through things and hitting rock bottom and you know how do we keep going because you know we've seen the last couple of years a lot of people just gave up you know we're seeing an epidemic of overdoses and suicides and homicides and you know just a disaster that we're we're facing socially so it's like gosh it would be nice to give be able to give people hope and to say here let, look Vinny went through cancer and came out of it like maybe i can get through this you know hernia repair that i gotta get fixed or whatever you kind of kind of have to put things in perspective at some point yeah, but you know, the cool thing about you, 
Brian, is that, and you told me this, I don't know if it was on your podcast or maybe when you were on my podcast, by the way, you need to come back again. I figured if I ask you on mic, you can't say no. Yeah, no, of course not. I'll never say no to you for sure. <laughs> so, no. um, you know, when you said, look, you know, I was just, I think you told me this the first time we met that night, you said, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm tired of just handing out medication. You know, there's got to be a better way. You know, I, I can't just hand out medication. I need to start my own thing and, and heal people because you guys, when you work for someone else, you're not really allowed to heal people, right? Is that, am I putting words in your mouth? Yeah, or, or ourselves because you're working 18 hours, 16 hours a day and, you know, stress and running around, not sleeping. And, and that's a badge of honor to do everything wrong is a badge of honor, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. true though. But at some yeah. point, like you, you had to find your passion and what you really love. Speaking of what really love, I have to not let you off the hook. What was it about Serena that, that you go, this girl's different? What was it that you that attracted you to her, other than looks, obviously? Um, the, the first thing was looks. I mean, uh, she's stunning. Um, vi she's visually stunning. And the woman is now 60 years old, and I'm 50 now. I'm turning 60 in a few months. And she was just, just, Stunning. And, and the first time I met her, she was in running clothes with Oakley glasses on and a hat in her face. And still, you can see through all of that. And the second time I met her, I didn't realize she was the same woman. I was with a different friend, same parking lot. Uh, we walked out of, we had breakfast at this breakfast place. We walked out and these two women had just dropped their kids off at school. And Serena was there. You know, you know how mommies bring kids to school. She had on a torn pair of sweats, the t-shirt. I'm pretty sure she slept in. Her hair was like up in a bun type thing, and you know, just no makeup on or anything. And my buddy Mayron and I sat down with these two women, just at, you know, because Mayron knew them from school, and we started talking. And I went, "Wait, Serena, you sound familiar. You look familiar. Do you know my friend Christina?" And she goes, "Yes." And she goes. I said, oh, I met you like eight months or a year ago and um, you were getting ready to go for a run. You were with uh, Lisa and the whole thing. And she goes, oh yeah, I remember you. You were going on a bike ride. I said, yeah, yeah. And um, I said, you know, I asked about you. I, I wanted to ask you out, but they told me you had a boyfriend. And she goes, yeah, I did. I said, well, she goes, I still do. And um, that was the beginning of our relationship. She's yeah, uh, what she didn't tell me was her boyfriend, they were in the middle of breaking up, but she was, she didn't want some hairy Italian guy just pouncing on her, right? But um, somehow we stayed in touch and um, it was a slow start. It wasn't like love at first sight. Um, I didn't know she was an actress. That would have been immediate red flag. In LA, actress, automatically, out the door, done. Um by the time I met her, she was a cliche. Uh, she was um, selling real estate. And uh, I, I knew her to be a real estate agent. And right before our first actual date, um, my friend said, I said, yeah, I have a date tonight. You know, this was like weeks and weeks later. We, we had been talking for several weeks. See, Brian, I never thought about Googling this woman. It, it just, that kind of thing never occurred to me, right? And... Um, this was like 2007. And I, I just went, um, I told my buddy, Jonathan, he goes, hey, would you like to come out with me and my wife to have dinner tonight? And I said, no, I have a date tonight. And he says, oh, anyone we know? I went, actually, I think um, you, your kids go to the same school. You know, your daughter, Maddie, goes to the same school with her daughter, uh, Viewpoint. He goes, um, yeah, what's her name? I said, her name is Serena. And I, maybe she was married before because she, I think her name is Thomas, but she says Scott Thomas. Or, I don't know. But it's just something like that. And Jonathan goes, Serena Scott Thomas. I went, yeah, 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 yeah. You know the girl? And she goes, she's not going out with you. And I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, dude, she's like, she's like the mommy at the school. You do realize that, right? I went, what are you talking about? It's like, so you don't know who she is. I went, and she's a real estate agent. He goes, and the Bond girl. And she's been in this movie and that movie and that TV show. And I went, oh, fuck, she's an actress? He goes, yeah, and she's the younger sister of Kristen Scott Thomas, you know, 
or whatever. And all of a sudden I was deflated because actresses, if you lived in LA, Brian, you would learn very fast. You don't date actresses, right? It's just not where you want to be. And, um, but we went out and it was a rocky first date. Rocky second, we had a second date. It was even rockier. And we decided not to see each other anymore. And then we ran into each other in Mammoth like about three weeks later. And um, that kind of kicked it off. Wow, that's pretty, that's crazy. So it wasn't love it. Like you didn't think you guys were a match right at the beginning. No, I was, I was hooked on the fact that she was an actress and um, she was upset because I had a ponytail. <laughs> not kidding. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny, huh? That's the same thing with my wife. My friends are like, she's not going to go out. I go, she, she, I'm going out with her. No, you're not. No, you're not. They thought I was playing. She was a year ahead of me in high school. And we met, I was a junior. She was a senior. So we both got an older woman, you know? Speaking of older women, I'm not going to let you off the hook, man. Because I, I don't want to, this to run, I have, I don't want to run out of time. You are on the number seventh most rated or watched Oprah. Yeah. And you came out in these, these, you know, I'm colorblind, man. So I can't tell if they're pink or magenta. So I got to. I, I call them fuchsia. Fuchsia. But, All right. Um, we'll call it fuchsia, man. That, if that works for you. I, I had never seen the Oprah show ever. Um, I knew it existed. And I knew it was like one of these daytime, you know, shows or whatever. Um, but um, I got on. It was like 91 or 92. And I had a buddy. He was a gay guy. And I'm. That, that's, that's where my out, gay guys know how to dress, right? I'm a Levi's and t-shirt guy. And I knew you're not supposed to wear that on Oprah. So I learned I was going on Oprah the day before, you know, like they needed someone to fill in. So I said, okay. Um, and I went to my buddy and I said, Hey, um, what does one wear on Oprah? And he goes, not what you wear. And I said, we're about the same size. What do you have? That whole outfit came from him. And he was even telling me, this is a Versace t-shirt. It's like $100. I'm like, for a t-shirt? $100? What? This is 91, right? I'm like, what? are you? And he goes, these are Versace pants. And they're like $300. I'm like, for, for jeans? But he put together that outfit for me. And um, well, heck, now I know. Out. Now I can now I can sleep at night. Because I was like, I wonder if Vinny picked that out or his agent or someone picked that out for him. No, I didn't have an agent at that time or anything. And um, I went on there and... I was bamboozled. I've told the story before. I talk about it in my movie. Um, I was dating an old, older woman at that time. She was a few years older than me. And they told me that it was younger men who dated older women. And I was in a relationship with this older woman who looked younger than me, right? I was like 30 or 31 at the time, something like maybe 30. And she was like 36. So come on. That's, and so I get to the Oprah show and I'm in the green room and they said, okay, this woman's name is Doe. She's your, you know, you're going to be sitting next to her. And I was like, wait, what? And by the way, it wasn't the Oprah people that put that together. It was my friend who got me on the show. It was about some club of older women who dated younger men. And this woman's boyfriend had just broken up with her like a week earlier. So she was going to look like a rube on the show. I didn't realize that I was a plant for her. Holy and, cow. That's good. Yeah. I remember you saying that. That is, that's. Yeah. It, it, and <laughs> I was like, I'm not going out there. And they said, okay, you don't have to say you guys date or anything. You just. It was just innuendo. Yeah. Just right? sit. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you'll be sitting next to her and you could talk about your girlfriend and you know, the whole thing. And I was like, Okay. Because I felt weird. I was there. The show is getting ready to start. They're miking me up. And, and then she introduces me. The show starts. This woman introduces me as her boyfriend. And I was like, okay, game on. And I said, I'm going to do everything I can to wreck the show. That now, is great, man. Brian, we were supposed to only be on for one segment. And then we're going to bring out some other freak show. So at, when they went to commercial break, they said, okay, you guys can all go. We're bringing out other people. And Oprah runs to the stage and she goes, he stays. Whatever you do, he stays, pointing to me. And the producers huddled up and went, well, if he stays, it would look weird. We got to keep everyone else and we can bring out these other people, but he's got to stay. And she goes, he's the show. 
because I was doing everything I could to wreck the show. And that made the show better. Yeah, yeah of course. It's going to be rated higher. Look at that. It's one of and our then, most popular ones after all these years, right? Yeah. Crazy. And the crazy thing is, is that the, the share thing happened in the second part of the show where I got on my knees and asked Cher out for a date. And they actually, Oprah brought me back about eight years ago, seven years ago, and did a where are they now thing where, you know, and she said, look, this is one of the most popular shows we've ever done. And it's because of this guy, where are they now? And um, so, yeah, I've been on Oprah twice. Look at it's that. Weird. It's and weird. Even, now that's kind of a joke, but man, you were on Mike Rowe. I love that interview. That was awesome. I'm like, dang, Vinny got on Mike Rowe. How, how the heck is <laughs> it's this? weird, that's right? So awesome, man. He's yeah. one of those guys on a bucket list that you want to, like, I, there's very few people I go, I really like to meet and talk to someone like that. So, yeah. How was that? I'm a big micro fan. And yeah, um, I think he's a truth guy, too. And he goes, here's how I see it. <laughs> I love it. His, his podcast is the best, man. I love it. I was listening to his podcast when he was doing the 15-minute version. And I loved it back then. Yeah, yeah it's I awesome. listening to it way back then. And um, I'm saying way back, but it was probably five years ago. And um, when when Chuck Klausmeyer said, hey, Mike saw your movie. He loves your movie. I'm like, come on. This is a joke, right? It's like, no, we want you on the show. I'm like, oh, come on. And um, you, you're way younger than me, right, Brian? You're early 50s? Maybe age-wise. Yeah, yeah. I'm 52. <laughs> yeah. 52, but um, physically, you're, you're, way, you're, you're like a 22-year-old, man. No, I don't think so. Um, but Mike... Mike and I, people have now said to me, wow, when we listen to Corolla and you and Mike Rowe, you're all three the same guy. And it turns out we're all three the same age, right? Hmm. And we have the same kind of, I've always said that people my age, we, we don't have a generation, right? We, we're not yuppies. We weren't yuppies. We were younger than them. We weren't, you know... Um, you know, people born in 1961, 62, 63, we, they never gave, you know, we were never marketed to by Madison Avenue, right? They just skipped our, you know, they just, I, I call us the nowhere generation. We, we're nowhere. Um, we all wear t-shirts and Levi jeans and we, we quietly do things, right? And we have our own thoughts and our own whatever, but we don't belong to any generation, if that makes any sense, right? Yeah. And yeah. so we're able to think freely. And, and I think Mike falls into that category. Corolla falls into that category. Uh, Dr. Drew, who's just a couple of years older than us, he falls into that category. And somehow I've, you know, somehow we, we've all, like the great magnet has pulled us all together, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it makes sense because you're real people and that's why your, your show's, you know, everyone loves it because you're real and you guys go here, here's how I see it. It may not be popular, but that's the way it is. And I think Mike Rose, the same way. All of you guys are the same way. You kind of say, this doesn't make sense. Does it, does yeah. this make sense to you? And then, you know, I think people enjoy if you're, you know, if you're just kowtowing to everyone and kissing up to everyone and trying to look good, you know, say what, put your finger in there, say what's popular today. Okay. I'm going to go with that. And that's, I think why you, you stand the test of time, you know, cause you, you just don't go for the fads that's happening right now. You know, you brought the magenta pants, Tr craze out i'm sure that's been yeah yeah big started, hit. you I might started. that might be this first skinny jeans uh <laughs> ever man you might have started that trend which we won't hold it against you man i, I never fell for that one yeah but but man i i, I want to be respectful of your time I, I have a question what's this is life's best medicine so for you for Vinny, what's life's best medicine what drives you what motivates you what do you say hey guys this is what really matters uh, just being enthusiastic about whatever it is. Um, you know, I'm, I'm turning 60 this year and I, I still feel like I'm 20. You know, it's like my brain still thinks like I'm 20. But you start looking around and and you go, okay, what what motivates me, right? And, you know, every year I do New Year's resolutions. And no matter how stupid they are, I try to see them through to, till the end of the year, right? And it, it keeps me disciplined to do that. And so 
I don't just do one or two, like some people, I'm just going to eat right for the whole year, I'm going to exercise every day. Um, I start thinking about them a day or two ahead of time. I don't think about them for a month ahead of time, you know, they, they just come a day or two ahead of time. And I write them down. So it's not just a thought, I'll see it written down. And then I try to do them. And this year it was, I have to do at least 365 hours of aerobics before the end of the year. And just walking through the neighborhood, that doesn't count. It's got to be, you know, actual aerobics. Um, and I'm way ahead of that game right now. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to get sick or something's going to happen. I have to travel a lot. And um, I did other things like, um, uh, you know, um, I have to do within those aerobic things. I have to get, I had to get to a million meters on my rowing machine before May 1st. And I, I was able to do that. And now before the end of the year, I need to get another million on my rowing machine. So that means that I have to be beholden to that. You know, I have to do a certain number of meters per month. And then you start thinking of other things, right? I've always said, you know how you do things in life, Brian, where you go, I've always want, you know, I, I see myself building a kayak, right? And I want to work with cedar strips and I, I want to be that guy, right? I, I watched this movie, Must Love Dogs, three times. Not, not so much because Diane Lane is hot, but because Kuzak is building rowboats out of wood, right? And it's a passion. And someone comes to him in the movie and says, hey, I want to buy that rowboat. You're a rich guy. He writes a check and he goes, hey, can you take a saw and cut it in half for me? And and he goes, wait, what? He goes, yeah, I just want to put it in my boathouse up on the wall. You know, just cut it in half. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that, right? And I started thinking about that. I went, I wonder what it's like to actually build a boat, you know, make something with your hands, because I've never done that, right? I've, I've built a combustible engine. I built a, a straight six once because I wanted to see what that was like. And um, actually, my dad got me into it when I was a kid because he was into that. But, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of building a kayak. And so I'm doing that. And if you say to me, what does that mean to you? And it's like, it means more to me than the three movies I made or the book I wrote because I'm doing something I never thought I can do, right? And I'm in the middle of doing it. And it won't make me money, right? It's, it's costing me money. I got to buy wood and glue and all this stuff. But it's, it's just, it's, it's what I'm doing now, right? And it's what's making me happy. And I think that's what counts in life. Making goals, seeing the goals through, you know, pretty man, simple. Man, that's great advice too. And it's like, it's kind of what you do too. And I, and I think what we do is you see, you see that lump of wood and you go, I see the fin finished product. And you get the joy of seeing the finished product when you help another person or you go through, you know, and make something better than when you got there, right? Yeah. And, you know, I'm making a new friend in the meantime. You know, the guy that, that's teaching me how to do this, uh, this kid, Joey Schott. Uh, I met him and the guy whose kayak that the, the designer of this kayak, um, uh, Nick Shada, who has a kayak in the Museum of Modern Art, you know, he's he's that good at it. I mean, if Nick builds your kayak, it's going to be forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of boat. And uh, I'm using one of his designs. And for me to build it, it's only costing whatever the wood and the glue costs. Right. And then, and then the fiberglass. And um I get to meet my hero, Nick, this weekend. I'm, I'm, I'm going up to Annapolis. It's, it's called the Big Little Boat Show. Um, coming up this holiday weekend. When are we? We're recording this on the 27th. So Yeah, we're on Friday of Memorial Weekend. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be there on the 28th and 29th to go look at other works that other people. I wouldn't have ever done this. There was no reason for me to ever go to, to Annapolis to go do any of this. Right? But now I'm, I'm going to travel hours just to go meet people who do the same thing. I mean, how cool is that? Yeah, it's cool creativity, and you learn from other people, and you go, "Oh, that's a good idea. I like that." You know, and, and you kind of just make things a little bit better. And I think that's probably a big part of your podcast and what you do. You want to learn more about topics. You make movies. You learn. You, you, you're always, uh, you know, keeping that mind young, and that's a huge thing. 
So, man, I don't want to keep you from your travels, but Vinny, hey, it's really good to have you, man. I appreciate you coming on and, you know, just being a real guy. And for people listening, I know I see Vinny on Twitter and he'll answer all the dumb tweets and he, he gets back to people and does all this stuff. I mean, that's a lot of work. I mean, that's a lot when you got stuff going on and, you know, I forgive you for ditching me here in California. You went on to the better land where you could go on boats to, and <laughs> row away and do all that stuff. So I may be calling you Vinny. Do you have any area in your, in your, any new houses in your area? No, but Hey man, I love what you're doing and, and keep up the good work. And, and again, thank you for joining me. You know, I know you're a busy guy, you know, doing podcasts all the time and everything. So it's, it's really good. I'm happy for the success you had and, you know, you got to go see Mike and do, you know, all kinds of cool stuff in life. And, you know, I think when you look back at the end, you're going to go, man, I lived my life. I did what I was supposed to do. And so, so many people are fearful of stepping out and you're a guy that says, Hey, I'm going to learn something new this year. I'm going to do something, you know, creative. And so everyone listening, this is, this is a gem, you know, spending some time with Vinny and, and picking up on his wisdom, going through a, <laughs> talk about a life, you know, life lived, you know, you've done it all, man. Yeah, look, and I tell everybody, I my my life started off like a Creedence Clearwater revival song. Um, I was born in the shotgun shack on a bayou. That's a fact. Um, so you can start on a bayou in a shotgun shack and somehow end up in Hollywood and you know marry a Bond girl and <laughs> and meet Mike Rowe one day. I guess I, I don't know, and a lot of really famous people. But it's all because. I was always dreaming, always thinking, you know, what can I do? What, what can I do? And then after cancer, I realized that I really didn't do anything yet. I need to do more. So never, never think it's over, you know? Yeah. Always take another breath and, and keep that heart beating and, and take a step. And, you know, sometimes we don't know where it's going. We just go on that journey and take it. So Vinny, thanks so much for joining me and everyone. Hey, be kind to yourself, be kind to others. Listen to what Vinny's saying, you know? learn something new, help someone do something right. And, uh, and look, look back at the end and say, Hey, I lived a good life. And, and, and again, I think that's really important. Like what will people say? What kind of impact do we leave? Ultimately it's not about how nice your car is or how big your house is. It's just, it's the impact we have on others. And, you know, Vinny, you're, you're living your life that way. So even if you're not invited you have to crash the party, sometimes you got to do that too, you know? <laughs> yep. I certainly <laughs> did that more than once. All right. Hey, have a good weekend, man. You too, brother. Thank you for listening to this episode. We greatly appreciate your support. We would greatly appreciate a positive thumbs up on all of the platforms like uh, iTunes and Spotify or wherever you're listening. And we just thank you for our Patreon supporters. Uh, we greatly appreciate yeah, your help in getting this message out. We think there's a lot of important information. And uh, hopefully this helps you. You know, Have a great day and thank you for listening and thank you for your support.